So good morning and good afternoon to everyone joining this session, wherever you are joining from. My name is Jennifer Kadim. Uh, it's great to have you all in our session on innovative financing for youth in locally led adaptation action. Our session is hosted by Student Energy, Makarere University Youth Climate Change Association and the International Center for Climate Change and Development. In short, it's called ECAT. Um, so right before um, beginning the main session, I would just briefly like to ask my colleagues who have been working to get this session uh, going uh, to introduce themselves a bit, just name and which organizations are they from. So I'll start with Joshua. Joshua. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Joshua Amponsim. Um, the executive director for Green Africa Youth Organization, uh, which is a co-host and a partner to CBA 14. And we are leading the youth inclusion track. So really happy to see all the youth sessions unfolding very successfully. And we look forward to your participation today on this very important topic. Thank you. Okay, Sakib. Hello everyone, my name is Sakib Haq. I'm a program coordinator at the International Center for Climate Change and Development based in Bangladesh. Glad to be a part of the session today. Okay, Barbara. Is she on the line, Barbara? Or Mimangsha? Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's perfect. I just, yeah. Um, uh, so my name is Barbara Etsi. I'm uh, the session coordinator volunteer for this session and I come from an events management background. Hi, everybody. Great, Mimangsha. Hi everyone, namaste from Nepal. Uh, I am the Zoom support volunteer for this session. Uh, so welcome everyone. And we also have David, our rapporteur. Hello everyone, I'm David Patalb. I'm from IIED, a researcher in the climate change group. Um, happy to be here, rapporteur for you. Okay, um, and we have a few more people. Joseph, would you like to just introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Joseph, the ambassador of Stop Ecocide here in Nigeria. Happy to see you guys. And Emmanuel. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Emmanuel. I'm the founder for Macquarie University Climate Change Association from Uganda. Thank you. We have Monica. I'm Monica. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My name is Monica from uh, I'm uh, from Action for Environment Education Nepal. I'd like to welcome you all in the uh, climate education situation. Thank you. Do we have Chibuna on the uh, call? Yes, we do. Yes, Chibuna. Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Chibuna Obuna. I'm working with Student Energy on the Global Youth Energy Outlook Project, and I'm representing the Sub-Saharan Africa region as the regional coordinator. Happy to be here. Perfect. And last, we have Atie. Hello, everyone. I'm Atie Khatibi. Uh, I'm working in public law institutions uh, of University of Tehran in Iran. I'm so glad to be here and looking forward to have a great discussion together. Perfect. Um, I hope I'm not forgetting anybody else. And I would like to request the uh, participants, if you'd like to take advantage of the chat box and tell us where you're from, just say a small hi or hello and from that country or uh, you know, that organization, that would be great to know each other. Um, I'm act requesting Sakib to go with the housekeeping rules, um, Sakib. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. So for those of us that have been attending um, CBA for the last few days, I think quite a, a lot of us are familiar with the Zoom functions as we have. So I'm just going to run through them a little bit. So if you can see either you're on your phone or your laptops, there's the unmute and start video buttons. So we'd request that if uh, everybody could keep themselves muted until we get into the discussion or breakout sessions. And if your uh, connection is a little bit weak for some of us as well, myself, It'll be a little bit weak during some of the sessions, so please feel free to turn off your video. We would request that at one point, maybe when we're trying to take a group photo, if you're able to, for that time, just to turn on your video so that everybody can get to know each other a bit. And as Jennifer mentioned, we have a chat function, so please feel free to write any comments or questions that you have during the session. And 
please start with your introduction from where you're from, anything that you'd like to uh, say about yourself. Please feel free to go through that. As some of the speakers will be doing a bit of a presentation, we'd also encourage everyone to use some of the reactions. So that, that's on the far right of the screen there. So please feel free, free to give any reactions or anything that you agree with, anything that you'd like to say. And then please, if you would like, follow up with that on the chat box. I will make one reminder for everybody is that we'll be recording the sessions today. So um, even in the breakouts, we'll try our best to be recording the sessions so that it helps us to keep up with the, the discussions that are happening. Uh, and then eventually we'll go into the breakouts. At that point, I would request that when we go into the breakouts, you might lose connection for a couple of moments. So please just uh, keep on top of your uh, phone or your laptop and you will be should be going into the breakouts in and out automatically. Our, our Zoom volunteers will be able to help with that. So I think that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Sakib. Um, so we will just give a brief of the session that we're uh, going to host now. Um, to begin the session, I would like to mention why it's so important to get young people involved in climate action. Um, so first of all, young people has the ability to drive change in the society. Um, in recent years, we have seen a surge in young people taking different initiatives all around the world to combat climate change impacts in their own communities, uh, both in the global north and in the global south. Um, there is a need to create more opportunities in terms of research, innovation and finance for young people to get involved in climate change adaptation. So when we talk about uh, climate finances, uh, we must understand what type of funding schemes should be available for youth um, and not only for the bigger uh, projects or national uh, to support the national budget, but what kind of funding schemes uh, are or should be available at local, national or regional level that will enable youth to enhance their uh, capacity and support their work the work that they're already doing in climate change. To do that, um, our session will explore some examples uh, from uh, uh, examples from both uh, the Global South and Global North, and we'll share some good practices, experience, and lesson how to promote cooperative action to enhance adaptation finance for youth. And we will try to identify actions, opportunities, and if necessary, policy changes or policy development to strengthen the support for locally led adaptation. So in a nutshell, that's the whole zest of the session that we are going to explore today. Um, but before we go into the presentations, uh, we, have some, we have two really great presentations from our colleagues. Um, we would like to do a small poll I would like to request my colleague Barbara to take over from me and we do a small poll for a few minutes. Barbara? Yes, um, I hope that everybody can see it. Um, if you can uh, please answer the few, these few questions. So what your <clears throat> age group is between 16, 20, 21, 25, 26, 30, 31, 35 and 36 plus years old. Um, I hope that everybody can see it. Um, yeah, I can see that you're already answering. Great. Um, gender, which region you're based in, how knowledgeable you are about climate change issues, and how knowledgeable are you on international and national funding issues. We'll wait for um, a few seconds more. I can see that almost um, good parts. Oh. Not sure. Okay, not sure what happened there. Um, so the poll is um, as handed. Um, if anyone else um, needs to answer. Yeah, so we have uh, uh, most of the results. I can um, pass it over to you. Thank you, Barbara. Um, so, um, 
the poll results um, will be discussed right before the breakout session. So we know that uh, where we are from, that will, uh, we hope that that will make the discussion more comprehensive. Um, so right uh, now, I would request our presenters to get ready with their presentations. And our first presenter is Atiye Khatibi from Iran. Um, she will give a presentation on the current challenges on adaptation finance and look on the current status of uh, locally led adaptation finance. So uh, Atiye, uh, if you're ready, we're good to go. Uh, yes, I'm ready. Just could you please share the PowerPoint slides? Yes. Thank you. I think Barbara has the PowerPoint slide. Okay, um, hello everyone. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening uh, to all the participants from around the globe. Uh, I'm Atiye Khatibi from Iran and uh, I'm talking about current challenges and climate change adaptation finance from the global um, situation perspective. And I hope to uh, keep the time and uh, explain on the challenges uh, very briefly. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Okay, as we all of uh, us know, a dramatic increase in investments in adaptation and resilience is necessary across the public and private sectors, but uh, the, we have seen a progress has been uh, uh, around the globe, but the progress uh, was very slow and we have to accelerate the progress uh, due, uh, due to uh, climate change adaptation finance. Uh, but unfortunately, investment in adaptation to date has achieved limited uh, success and faced many challenges that we're talking about challenges um, today in this discussion. Next slide. I have categorized uh, the challenges uh, regarding to climate change adaptation finance into four categories, and uh, I will uh, explain uh, briefly on, on the subcategories of the uh, of a title. Um, the, one of the most important challenges in adequate support for an adaptation investment, despite the urgent need uh, to investment in public and private sectors for climate change adaptation, the political leaders are really reticent to commit on um, investment in um, adaptation. Um, the, uh, the first category is insufficient public financial support. Despite the enormous climate resilient investment needs, progress has been slow. Uh, as of 2018, only six of G20 countries had submitted long-term climate, uh, climate change plans to the UNFCC, and G20 established climate um, adaptation, climate change adaptation working group very recently in 2018. On the other hand, although aiming to deliver 50-50 balance between adaptation and mitigation uh, projects in 2015 and 2016, uh, only 27% of climate change flows uh, from major OECD donors to developing countries in adaptation projects. And the point is that we need to uh, track financial uh, flows and establishing a tracking system would be great to uh, manage large amount donor funds more effectively. The second one is insufficient incentives for private uh, finance to act. As you know, investments in adaptation has faced with two discrete components of investor adaptation. The first one, low awareness of the opportunities to um, invest in adaptation and low awareness of the climate change impacts and investment returns. And the second one is the lack of commitment to consider resource and financial capitals into adaptation. And although the information on the link between climate change and um, a natural disaster has been uh, increasing, but the link between financial risk arising from climate risk is not really well known. And besides this, the governments are not very eager to commit a positive obligation on sustainable development goals and environmental and social uh, priorities. But most of the positive commitment is related to renewable energy. And the last one in this category is low level awareness of the need for adaptation um, and source of funding. There is increasing activity on adaptation. Nonetheless, there is limited awareness on climate change 
impacts and uh, adaptation uh, option among local community and non-state stakeholders. All of us uh, know that these actors, I mean local community and non-state stakeholders are really effective in playing a role in adaptation. But unfortunately, the information on financial resources at international, national, and local level are scattered uh, among recipient governments. Lack of this awareness could uh, prevent local actors uh, for playing their uh, active role in adaptation. Some example of this information is how much finance um, available, how can access it, and how, would, how uh, its uh, finance meets the needs of adaptation. Without access to information, non-state stakeholders cannot identify uh, the most relevant sources for their countries. And which I should just notice that the CEF country support uh, has been de designed to address um, some of these challenges by providing information and support to countries in um, accessing funds. Next slide, please. Uh, the next category is policy and practice in the financial industry. Uh, and uh, I should just notice the first one, uh, which is a weak legal framework, which is really important in financial industry. Um, at the system levels, financial uh, regulation on climate uh, disclosure and climate risk management has lagged. Even if there is a regulation, but um, the, its enforcement um, um, is the other issue. Uh, most of the rules and regulation has focused on systemic risk management and compliance, but they have not focused um, on adaptation, risk disclosure, um, central issues of financial management. And um, the last one in the in this category is a lack of harmonized metrics and standards, um, which I think it, it is really important. Uh, and I will explain why it is, uh, it is more important than weak legal framework even. Um, we need some climate re uh, resilience metrics to measure the effectiveness of financial activities. But as the adaptation context um, is really specific, uh, it's really challenging to define, um, uh, define metrics in order to uh, evaluate the success. And part of a problem is inadequate methodologies and evaluation techniques for all types of investment. On the other hand, um, as the methodologies of defining metric is different in each country, even the definition of adaptation is different uh, between, um, is, between every country, it is really difficult to reach the common metrics and standards for evaluation. So we need the common definition, terminologies, evaluate metric and categories to um, take uh, further steps in this, in this regard. Could you please uh, move to the next slide? Uh, the other one is uh, market challenges, uh, uh, which is really uh, important and related to the financial uh, challenges in uh, climate change adaptation. Um, even if there is uh, awareness of risks, uh, market barriers uh, still is the other barrier uh, to investment in, adapt in climate change adaptation. Um, the first one is perceived lack of profitable investments. Um, though many adaptation measures are um, ripe for investment, some um, investment in adaptation are perceived as public goods, and governments often struggle to internalize these benefits or align them with uh, private incentive um, sufficiently to attract uh, investors. Many of the valuable, uh, many, many of the vulnerable countries which are most in need of adaptation are also the markets perceived to be the riskiest investors. Uh, and the last one is perceived low commercial readiness of adaptation. Many adaptation technologies are going to offer the promise of cost reduction, but often it's really difficult to uh, convince investors uh, on the marginal increase in profit uh, profitability. In some cases, the risk award profile of, of investment is prohibitive for investors. Um, investment opportunities are too uh, capital intensive or the potential to reduce expected lo losses or value at risk um, serves as, a, um, as an insufficient in, uh, impetus to drive uh, investment. Next slide. 
Uh, and the last category I would like to explain uh, on is a uh, low capacity for adaptation. And uh, this, uh, these two, uh, two subcategories is low capacity within the financial system governance bodies and the last one, low level capacity to develop projects and monitor and evaluate progress. Um, Understanding of climate risk is necessary at financial decision making, but there is not understanding at, um, at these levels. And uh, the financial regulatory agencies are lacking this uh, expertise, as this is a new issue and also financial issues is really complicated and involve a, com a complex mix of science, economics, management, and policy. And still more steps should be taken to integrate climate risks in uh, financial uh, management risks. And uh, some of the developing countries may be leaders in this respect as having already adopted policies to provide um, consensual terms for climate uh, related um, lending and consideration of climate change in the management of their um, pension funds. And the last one I would like to notice uh, that uh, access to climate adaptation finance can also be limited by low technology capacity, by low technical capacity to propose and develop projects. Most of the vulnerable countries need capacity to present the full set of projects, outputs in a logical manner to get the fund from investors. The investors ex expect project proponents to demonstrate that their projects are effective have opportunities, uh, risk management mechanism, and will achieve a favorable uh, internal rate of return, which is quite challenging for today. Um, next slide. And um, um, just uh, finally, I would like to mention that I just mentioned some challenges, but uh, um, I'm looking forward to have a great discussion today to uh, reach some solution and how we can overcome these barriers. Because as we all of us know that given the increasing urgency with climate risks and the potential that climate changes will occur more rapidly and with greater impact than uh, we think about now, uh, there is no time uh, to lose and we have to accelerate our, um, our measures um, to have impact um, in, in near future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Atiyeh, for shedding some light on the current uh, challenges in the financial climate finance uh, sector. I think it's a, a huge uh, issue in the global south that we have very low adaptive knowledge and adaptive, uh, adaptive capacity at the moment. And we need, really need to get into the, you know, uh, into the better discussion from the breakout sessions that I hope some of our participants can give us great innovative uh, solutions. And I'm expecting quite a good number of examples in how we can mitigate this situation and build better uh, financial mechanism. Um, so our next presenter is um, Sergey Joy. Um, sorry if I pronounced it wrong again. So his presentation is on financing youth-led adaptation action and he will shed some light on the current challenges and case studies from Western Africa. Sergey, the floor is yours. Okay, good morning. Can you please put the presentation? Thank you very much. So thank you everyone and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be part of this uh, amazing session. I would also like to thank my the previous uh, speaker, Atie Katibi. I think uh, he made a very brilliant presentation and make my job very easy. So go to the next slide. What I'm going to do, the first part of my presentation, I will precise a couple of things on regarding uh, adaptation financing and the challenge uh, my previous speaker already started talking about and I will try to focus in the second part of my presentation on some of the paradigm I think is needed to be shifted in order to improve uh, a support to youth-led uh, adaptation action through financing mechanism. Go to next, please. So when it comes to adaptation financing. I think it's very important we start to understand what climate finance means. 
And we make a lot of mistakes when you ask a lot of people what is climate finance. The first thing come in their mind in green climate fund. So everybody thinks that uh, climate finance means green climate fund. And that's a very, very huge mistake. Climate finance doesn't mean green climate fund. Green climate fund is just a, an example of an international mechanism to support mitigation adaptation project. But climate finance it, itself refer to local, national, or transnational financing drawn from public, private, or alternative source of financing that seek to support both mitigation and adaptation action. So when we come to understand that we can still have a local mechanism and to support uh, adaptation process, I think that is a very, very important move. The other things I want to address in this part is just to highlight the fact that Africa today counts about 14% of the world population and uh, only 3% of all climate finance and flow into the continent. So just to highlight a couple of gaps so it can help us to understand what is important to make this move. And finally, I also want to highlight the fact that climate financing does not mean financing energy transition because here we are discussing the challenge regarding adaptation or mitigation financing. And when it comes to find fund from climate mechanism, the first sector who come to mind to everyone is energy sector. That make the country in the continent like Africa or Sub-Saharan Africa, where the target or the priority is adaptation, they finish to lose a lot of support because the target and the focus is in the energy transition. Go to the next please. So when it comes to challenges, I try to highlight four different challenges just to support what has been already presented. The first one, I put it in the budget cycle. You know, most of the developing country is a struggle to raise funds for adaptation or both for mitigation also, because they have to adapt to the fund the budget cycle. I think big funding, uh, climate funding support like Green Climate Fund or Adaptation Fund or International uh, Investment Fund, all this is very, very hard for the country to be able to adapt the normal or traditional budget cycle to this funding cycle. And it's also one of the critical challenges. The second one is, a, is about governance. I think most of the climate funds in Africa or support in Africa go to strategy and program development that take uh, over five years. Some uh, is to develop the national adaptation program process, uh, the NDC development and the revision. I have been working with many countries who have started the revision of the NDC without implementing the previous one. So like we have an NDC since uh, the Paris Accord, and now five years later, we are, we are doing the revision. We have even started implementing the previous NDC. So we have to know what is a priority. Is the priority putting the support into the action or read this money to do readiness program, to develop strategy or to develop plan, and uh, five years later, go again and do the revision of this plan. That is one of the challenges. Go to the next, please. The other one is uh, in the impact. I think it's related to the previous because the focus is not put most of the time in the country priority, whom as in our context are adaptation action and is more put in uh, just a project uh, to support a transition or to be able to easily count the, 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 the avoided uh, green gas hazards emission. And the last, before I go to the, the second part of my presentation, is about accountability. Most of the our policy makers in our country, they are more focused and being accountable to the founder, but not to the people and not uh, to the young people who are driving a climate action and not to the community. And that is also a challenge 
when the focus has to be how can we manage the system to be able to be accountable to the founder. It's not wrong to be accountable to the founder, but when is the only priority is become the problem. Go to the next, please. Now, in uh, this slide, I think that is the most important of the difference uh, within the previous presentation is uh, how to shift uh, the paradigm in, in, in supporting youth-led uh, adaptation action. And I, I, I just want to focus on these uh, three points. The, as we all know that the money, as uh, the, the founder, the expert in finance should tell you, the money always flow in the direction of capability and capacity. That means when we support the development of capacity or building capacity among young people, we are preparing them to be able to easily assess these funds and, and support. The second one that the money move and flow in the direction of trust and partnership and relationship. And I think this is one of the biggest problem when it comes to support youth-led action, trust. Because traditionally we are learned that the young people, they are not responsible and the young people, we cannot give them a huge money they cannot, no, I think we, we have to shift the paradigm today and uh, not see the young people not only as uh, those who are driving climate action and participating in the advocacy and corps and this and that, but when it comes to the action at local and national level, we don't trust them. But when it comes to negotiation, we say, oh, we trust them. They are the ones who are leading the action. And when it comes to the project, no, 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 we cannot give them money, no. If we can trust them in leading policy and uh, changing policy at very high level, why we cannot trust them in implementing action in local level? So it's very important that we consider that as far as we want to put trust in young people or partner with them, it will be difficult for this climate fund or adaptation fund to flow into that direction. And the last one, is that we have to note also that the money flow in the direction of solution to solve a problem. And uh, the, in this point, I will also be a little critical on us as a young people, because of, in a context like in Africa, we have a lot of solvable problem. That means the problem is there. We know every year and everywhere, we know what are the challenges. Now is our, our, in our responsibility now to think and to design solution and to be innovative. And when we find the right solution to this solvable problem, it's easy for us to put ourselves in the direction of the money. But as far as we will focus most of the time in advocacy and not propose a very concrete solution and action, will be difficult also to assess this form. So to summary, I think we should always keep in mind that the money flow in the direction of capacity and capability, in the direction of trust and partnership, and in the direction of solution to solve the problem. So as far as we tackle these three points, we will be able to easily put ourselves in the position to drive more support to youth-led adaptation action. I think that's all I have to share for now, and I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think it was very interesting how you wrapped up your presentation at the end, because um, you already gave a great uh, solution, because uh, it is true that when we think about climate finance and we think about how we can involve the youth uh, community to it in any way possible, we, all, we always think that if uh, they're enough knowledgeable, if they have the capacity, but at the same time to take action, a lot of youth community are struggling with financial issues. So to trust and uh, you know, have a good relationship between the two parties is really essential. I think that actually leads to the point of innovative solutions. So that was really, really interesting to know. So thank you. Um, I think before we go to the... Um, uh, breakout sessions. I think my colleague Barbara 
would like to take the poll again because I think there are a few more people joined in at the end. So we would like to uh, just take the poll questions again and maybe go to the breakout room sessions in about Barbara. Yes, um, uh, so if I can ask everyone to um, uh, give uh, their answer to the poll again, and I hope that everybody can see it. Um, uh, just a quick reminder that um, uh, all uh, the co-hosts of the session are not able to answer. So um, we'll, uh, we'll give about a minute and a half to, for everybody to respond. Uh, but we have five questions. So what's your age, what's your gender, um, which region you're based in, and how knowledgeable are you on climate change issues, as well as how knowledgeable are you on international and national funding issues. Um, We have about half of the participants now who responded. If uh, everybody can choose their answers. Has everybody um, responded to the poll? Okay, I will be um, ending it in a couple of seconds. Um, uh, so we have 58% of uh, uh, participants who voted. I've just ended it and uh, I will be sharing the results with you. I um, hope that everybody can see it, but um, our participants are 17% um, between 20, 21 to 25 years old, um, as well as 17%, 26 to 30, um, 22, 31 to 35, and 44% is 36 years old plus. Um, we have a 72% um, female participating uh, versus 28% male. Um, 28% of the participants are from Asia and 28 from Africa, 6% from Australia and Pacific region, and 39% from Europe, nobody from uh, North America and South America. And uh, most uh, people are somewhat um, knowledgeable about climate change and uh, very much is a 39%. Um, and in terms of national funding issues, 22% is not at all, and 61 is somewhat um, um, knowledgeable, and 17% very much. So these are the um, results to the poll. I'll uh, stop sharing it and uh, give it back to you. Thank you, Barbara. Um, so, before we go to the breakout sessions, um, Sakib, do you want to uh, post the questions on the chat box or do you want me to go through them just one, one time? Hello? Hello? Can anyone hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Apo Sakib Bhai posted the questions in the chat. Yeah. Okay. Still, uh, do you want me to go through the questions just once? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so w overall, what I would say in terms of the discussions, I know we've we've looked at some uh, sort of the issues and the challenges that we've been having in terms of innovative financing for you, but. What we're hoping is that basing on the, the question topics, what we'd like to focus on is moving from a little from the challenges and looking at what are some of the solutions that we could try and focus on, whether they're opportunities that we're not capitalizing on now, what are the things that we should be looking towards. 
and looking at what are the different ways that uh, I think as our presenters also framed it, what are the different ways that the youth could be getting involved in the different opportunities that are coming forward? So uh, if the breakout rooms are set, uh, Mimancha or Barbara? Yeah, it's ready. Okay. Um, I'd remind everybody again, maybe you might lose connection for the room uh, for a couple of seconds, but hopefully it goes through. Hi, everyone. I think everyone's just sort of filtering back in from the different breakouts. I would like to thank everybody that was facilitating and participating in the breakouts. Um, again, if you do have any questions or anything that you would like to know or something that you didn't quite get to finish, feel free to use the chat box. I'd also use this opportunity now to remind everybody that there are discussion boards on the HOVA app for CBA 14 conference. So if you do uh, wanna take a little bit of time to think about something or something comes to mind later on, please do feel free to reach out and uh, write on the discussion boards and we'll try and follow up as much as possible. Jennifer? Yes. Um, so I think everyone had a very good discussion. I think there was a you know, time constraint, but maybe we can have a bit more discussion here in the main session. So um, I would like to ask the first group um, the, who were working on the guiding question one to give us a few points from uh, key highlights from their discussion. Uh, either the facilitators or if any of the participants uh, want to go, please feel free to do so. Uh, uh, yes, this is Emmanuel. In our group, group session, session one, uh, the question we we're looking at uh, was what are the current financial schemes? Uh, what is the role of the youth in implementing adaptation finance opportunities? And that's at the local level. And what are the benefits of engaging the youth uh, for governments internally? And among uh, the key critical issues that, that came up from, from our group, one is yes, we agree there are a couple of possible financing streams uh, for climate change adaptation. Uh, and we looked at uh, one that we call co workers based financing. Uh, which is within the Red Cross movement and other non-Red Cross actors that's looking at uh, releasing funds to take anticipatory action, early actions before disasters see tribe. And these actions range from actions at local level that build community resilience and also actions that uh, prepare these communities in case disasters see tribe for effective response uh, because yes, we agree uh, that due to climate change, the frequency of disasters and the magnitude are increasing in number. So we looked at that and uh, that the youth being uh, energetic and they are within these communities, they are a, a, a huge, they play a critical gap in undertaking those actions at community levels. The second critical issue we looked at in our group was the need for local organizations to incorporate climate financing in their corporate social responsibilities. Uh, and I think the last point I can share here was also uh, that the youth are still enthusiastic, but they need a lot of capacity building and to be involved from the beginning, not at the point where they are now having plans and what and they are looking for funds. So it's all comprehensive. There is need to build their capacity, first of all, in understanding uh, what the challenge we are facing is climate change in all its different dimensions, such that they are able to make um, appropriate actions and also some of these financing streams have really strict requirements. So it goes back to the capacity building, engaging them in all these activities that are within country, like developing the indices and so on. That's what I can share for now. Thank you from our group. Thank Unless you, Emmanuel. The group wants to add something on that. Yeah. 
or if anyone has any comments uh, on these findings or these points, just go ahead. If not, I will move on to the second group. Um, what could be the best way for countries, municipalities, and cities to mobilize funds internally to support locally led adaptation? Um, anyone from that group wants to present? If not, I will request Sakib to do it. Uh, sure. I'd, uh, if anybody wants to add in anything, then please feel free. So we had a little bit of a talk sure. about how we can, uh, I hope everybody can see my screen how we can be looking at uh, yes. using sort of donor funding to kick off uh, projects for youth, but then sort of trying to see how that can be absorbed into national uh, funding mechanisms, either through budgets or city corporation budgets or national level budgets, et cetera. So maybe that's some sort of a linkage that we could be looking in terms of mobilizing funding, as there is quite a lot of donor interest in um, doing youth projects, but <laughs> it, it, they are sort of projectized and uh, short term. So maybe involving uh, public sector entities and government agencies, that might be some way of uh, trying to think about that in the longer term. Uh, we had a little bit of talk of coordinating the youth into sort of national platforms. So again, pitching one of the, the Global Center on Adaptations initiatives, the youth adaptation networks is some, uh, something that's been kicking off and we're hoping we'll be picking up a lot of steam and these sorts of issues are some of the things that we would like to be tackling within that. So please feel free to join in those. Um, Again, looking at how youth uh, or youth individually or youth organizations or community groups could be focusing on private sector entities within their uh, countries and maybe using them as a sort of investment platform as well. What are some of the ways that we could be mobilizing funding from them? We had a little bit of talk about areas that the youth should be focusing on in terms of uh, what are most attractive, uh, quote unquote, attractive for getting funding nowadays. That could be in terms of focusing on adaptation and di uh, disaster risk re reduction in the sense of you know, having a little bit of investment coming now can really save you with larger costs and future expenses later on. So maybe those are some of the activities that a lot of the youth could be uh, focusing on, building a little bit of awareness for the youth to be understanding those things. And again, a little bit more focus in terms of what the youth are really geared up to do is sort of uh, being a little bit more mobile and adaptable on new technologies using communication platforms, social media platforms, or even other sort of innovative creative technologies like mapping and remote sensing. So maybe those are some of the strengths that the youth uh, locally led actions could be focusing towards. These are sorts of things that a lot of youth are a little bit more familiar and with a little bit of capacity building and a little bit of sort of resource support, those are some things that maybe uh, could be used in terms of mobilizing larger funding and getting uh, bigger um, projects and initiatives kicked off. So if I've forgotten anything, I'd uh, hand over to everybody in our group. If not, I think that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Sakib. Um, I was just wondering, while the breakout sessions uh, brought about really good points from uh, based on the thematic questions, but if you had any comparative, uh, you know, uh, not really analysis, but if there are some comparison between the Global South and Global North, where youth are actually getting more opportunities or maybe less and how we can create more opportunities where there are none and maybe focus on a bit on the gender issues if you have any that would be great for the discussion just food for thought um, so moving on to the breakout session three how do young people want to be engaged engaged to ensure sustainable financing for locally led at a locally led action so anyone from that breakout session, the floor is yours. Hello. I think group three was Adnan and Chibuna. Okay, I hope they're still here. Yeah, Chibuna, would you like to start? I can pitch in. Uh, uh, Adnan, why don't you start and then we'll call on Chibun a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Let me share my screen. Can you guys see? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, so um, moving into our groups, um, we basically discussed like what are the avenues we can um, mobilize, especially from the youth groups to help um, self-sustaining finance 
for them, for especially projects they're leading or they want to lead. So one of the um, important points I think that came at the end of the um, session was how can microfinance or self-sustaining loans for the youth group can help um, youth groups uh, flourish their ideas regarding climate action or locally led action. Uh, I think one of the important, I think one of the important points that came out, I think it was from Juliet, uh, youth, need, youth groups need to know or they need to be uh, made aware of self-sustaining models or tools that can help um, youth um, flourish in their ideas. Uh, it's often seen that um, youth groups have amazing ideas, but they don't um, know certain pathways or they are not aware of, um, for example, um, if they want to, if they want to um, include ideas for a project, they don't necessarily know the information on how to self be self-sustaining or how to access those information to scale up their project. I think that's really um, important, especially when you are um, dealing with climate finance, like where to get that information or how to get involved in the processes to avail the, those information, especially uh, if you want to start a project in their uh, local communities. Um, I think those are the two key points from our group. Um, I would request anyone from our group or Tibuna if they want to add anything. Tibuna, would you like to pitch in? Um, yeah, just um, to give a brief um, overview of everything. Thank you, Adnan, for that intervention. So majorly, um, our discussion um, focused on how to enable young people to um, assess funds in a simple way, how to enable them to um, build the capacity to, you know, to handle these projects and then gain the accountability necessary to attract uh, funding for climate adaptation. So um, that's just what we have. And um, my colleague has already made the points clear. So I'll just stop at that. So the, the major thing is how can we help young people to simplify the, uh, the processes and the requirements for assessing funds? And how can we ensure that they build the capacity in order to um, maintain the accountability during these projects um, in, uh, in the local communities? Thank you. Thank you, Adnan and Jibuna. Thank you, um, group three. Um, so since we're really low in time, I'll just straight go to the group four. Um, their guiding question was, what are the possible ways to encourage fund or fund youths to learn about the climate crisis, develop a solution for an issue they're passionate about and take action to lead real powerful environmental change in their communities? Um, anyone from group four wants to take it? question has a lot um, a lot of uh, sub, uh, sub uh, type of question so I uh, will just focus on uh, the need to 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 help you to uh, learn about uh, climate change so we, we discussed about the, the the little amount of uh, youth that, part uh, that is participating in youth um, crisis or youth fight so uh, we also discuss about uh, making climate change learning, especially giving attention, attention should be given to contribution of schools and young people in also doing it. It's so important to, uh, to build uh, upon their participating learning in school curriculum. We also look into uh, starting uh, a youth uh, learning about climate change in uh, local communities, uh, so as in schools and social gathering. And we also talk about um, the importance of religious leaders involving in climate change. So we discussed that uh, because religious leaders set an agenda for congregation uh, talk about and care about. So it is important to be said, uh, to said a lot to the whole congregation. It is important for members to be concerned with. So we also talk about um, making sure that um, uh, youth uh, receive stipend or fiscal sponsorship to to learn about climate change. So 
we discussed that it is vital to pay youth to participate in climate change, also to fund them to take action. Thank you. So I don't know, Monica, do you have anything to contribute? Thank you, Joseph. Um, if anyone wants to make a comment on the findings from the four groups or make any suggestion, share any examples or opportunities for youth, you have a few minutes. We can give a few minutes if you like. Is there anyone, anyone interested? Yeah, just one well, I minute. I think we got a question in the chat box. Oh, sorry, please go ahead. Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, I think uh, I can just generate some ideas from my own experience. Uh, because normally, I think as young people nowadays, we need to participate. We cannot participate without getting anything from whatsoever activity that we are pushing. So I think that gives us a very bad, uh, or paints a very bad picture to those who have the resources. So I think one way of generating interest is about getting the uh, the necessary uh, uh, youth leaders who are serious, and then setting the agenda uh, um, um, and, and also uh, uh, stating what value can we add to already existing programs. Uh, otherwise, I think uh, with the uh, experience that I have, most of the young people from where I'm coming from, they are not ready to do things just for free voluntarily. And it defeats the whole purpose of uh, uh, donor supporting the initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, I, think, I think this was also something that we covered a little bit in one of the other sessions talking about how to involve youth a lot more into um, climate related projects but then also being a little bit aware of the fact that not all youth are within the same sort of um, uh, standing and background. They might have economic struggles from lower income households. They might have uh, household responsibilities, so on. So then also asking a lot of youth to, assuming that they have a lot of free time and a free uh, resource to being able to sort of volunteer and get involved with projects, that's, that's a big ask. And that's maybe something that we, we should be rethinking as well in terms of how we sort of mobilize these uh, projects what are the best ways of sort of involving the youth in terms of making it a more attractive and incentive project for them to get involved in? That's a very good point. Anyone else? Uh, sorry, can I just add something? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, regarding to the first question, uh, maybe I just would like to share this point that um, local participation, especially youth people in adaptation process could help governments to prioritize their recipient fund um, on the needs of most vulnerable groups and local volunteer, uh, particularly youth, because uh, we know that um, um, the, the amount of uh, climate change adaptation fund is not really mu much. and. Uh, we have to ask youth people and also um, local uh, NGOs in the local community to go through the local community and ask them about their needs and about their uh, about their approach um, on uh, climate change adaptation so they can uh, pass these kinds of information to local um, governments and also to national government level uh, and they will, uh, we have to encourage the local government and national government to use these kinds of information which provided by youth people in their, in the, uh, in uh, developing their plans, especially national climate action uh, on adaptation. Uh, so uh, the government uh, will also be able to um, um, to uh, prioritize the the budget and the needs of vul uh, vulnerable group uh, because uh, they uh, they have already have some information about the needs of uh, people. So uh, it's a good chance for them to um, to get the fund and then um, allocate the funds to the most vulnerable uh, people. And one of the participants asks a question: How we sh uh, how we could be sure that uh, the government uh, will um, will consider the vulnerable needs rather than uh, their needs but i have to say that we um, we have to ask government although it's really difficult and challenging but we have to ask them to establish um, some online platform like which can um, uh, which can work like a database uh, so it will uh, it will 
it will be so transparent for all the uh, for all uh, local community and also youth people to see what kinds of uh, what kinds of uh, financial resources um, have been provided by the by the other um, international community for for their government and how they will um, how they will um, uh, they will use these kinds of resources in the local community. Um, uh, so I think one of the most important issues is just establishing an online platform for evaluation the success and also for monitoring the financial resources. Thank you. Thank you, Atiye. I think we actually came at the end of the session and I will request Joshua to take over to wrap it up. And maybe if you have any points to highlight that you found really interesting from the discussion, that would be great as well. And before we log out, we will also take one or two photos. So Joshua. Yes, thank you very much. Um, it's been an awesome session. Um, I think what I found very striking is that there are not really clear solutions yet. There are bits of uh, what we could do, what we can improve. There are a bit of also knowledge gaps in understanding what finance is uh, in itself and how to get the money. I'm guessing that for me as a summary, as a closing remark, um, what I would urge all of us to do is to really look for successful case studies that we could have like a resource repository of how folks manage to mobilize uh, um, locally led finance, particularly for youth led projects. Because I, I saw that particularly in my group, for instance, and also through the feedback uh, that came after the group session that there are not enough examples. There are examples which are good, but there are not enough of them. And we will need enough examples and case studies, successful case studies, uh, or maybe not also successful case studies. So we can know what doesn't work uh, and get more examples of what works so that we can help uh, sort of develop this further. Um, big thanks to everyone who contributed. Uh, it's been very great uh, knowing sort of the, the, the process that some of you have been through. Um, colleagues from ICAP who shared sort of concrete examples. That was very, very helpful. Um, Adnan from WaterAid, also very great that you, you had some on this as well. So thanks a lot for everyone who contributed to our presenters. Uh, this was also great, sharing your knowledge with us. Um, and we look forward to engaging you further and as Sakib said, I would like to re-emphasize to use the Hoover app uh, to further conversations. And if you have any documents, uh, if you have any materials that helps to sort of even explain better what you, what you presented during the presentation or what you talked about, any examples you gave, it will be good for us to have, have this somewhere that folks can refer to when they think about this uh, important topic. Having said that, Thanks to everyone, and I will uh, encourage everyone to turn their camera on uh, so we can have a group photo together. <laughs>